Welcome to Field Sports Britain. Coming up, sporting shooter editor Dom Holtam is on crop protection duty with the Crow Man. Stalker Oliver Power has a big shot American hunter over here to find a muntjac, but all he ends up doing is saving one. First, we're after Rodos with Team Wild TV. <laughs> This week, Team Wild has travelled north of the border to Scotland to help with the Rodo Coal. The deer are creating havoc on this particular farm, which has planted acres of willow for biofuel. Thousands of pounds worth of damage has been done to this plantation, and much of the crop is already a lost cause. Nowadays, people are coming in and offering money to, to shoot and they want trophies. Hence, some of the problems that you'll see in this plantation here, where the doe population's really rocketed. Our guide for this Scottish expedition is Andy Richardson, famous for his goose guiding and delivering excellent sport in Fife and all across Scotland. The damage to these trees, you know, it even goes up as far as, as that height. And you know, we don't have red deer here, this is raw. So it's just growing through with this damage and it's it's kind of stunted the growth. You can see the, the healthier trees and and this is what's left. So That's what do they do? Do they like bite off the yeah, the, the bite off the branches and the shoots at the top? And then they just eat the whole the whole piece. The ground is crisp underfoot this morning. So much so, we have a strong feeling that we won't make a dent in that number quite yet. So we've changed tactics slightly. It's very crisp in there, it's still a very cold morning and it sounds like you're walking on cornflakes. It's too noisy to walk in the willows now. So we've come outside, just along the side of the woodland margin here, on the outside of the willows. We're going to wait here and see if any does come out. If not, we'll go for breakfast and come back later on this afternoon. Unfortunately, it's a no-show. But there's still plenty of time. And Andy reassures us there's plenty of deer. They may be damaging the willow, but with such a high density of young trees, I'm a bit worried about the willow deflecting the path of my bullet. So Andy, I've bought a Ruger M77 and 243 uh, for the for the doe coal. Mm -hmm. But you actually prefer a slightly heavier calibre in and amongst these willows. Yeah, I would say a 30 calibre, 308 or a 306, 180 grain bullet. If it does hit a twig, You've got a fair chance of it carrying on through to the to the beast. Whereas a lighter weight bullet may fragment and... Yeah, and you've got a chance of deflection. So always use enough gun? Always use enough gun. Okay. Later that afternoon, we go to a neighbouring plantation to try our luck. We check every aisle in turn in the hope of deer. Overhead, the geese are on the move, and so is the doe that Andy spotted. We try to anticipate the direction the deer's heading in, and get ready for a shot in the row we think she'll eventually cross. My first attempt proves unsuccessful, as she bounds out of the way. Plus, I prefer a clearer shot. We then find our deer. She drops on the spot. So this is a beautiful young doe. This is exactly what we've been looking for. As Andy said this morning, we want to be taking the young ones out and leaving the older does in there. This is one of last year's does, so absolutely perfect for us. Nice body weight in pretty good condition. Obviously the feeding has been very good. It was a pretty tricky stalk. Andy spotted her pretty early on. Um, just saw a backside disappearing from one row of willow over to another row. and uh, We lost sight of her for a little while and then we caught up with her I tried to get into position but made too much noise, that's what happens when you're a big lad like myself. Um, but we managed to stalk her back up here. She didn't see us the first time around but she heard me. So she wasn't too spooked but she skipped off. She came up probably about three or four rows up here and then she presented a shot. And she only presented a neck shot. I'd like to have gone in the body, particularly seeing that probably about 120 yards. So off the knee, uh, it's, it's, it's a reasonably, di well, reasonably difficult shot. Uh, but here she is anyway, so very pleased. First one for the uh, first one for the larder, and we're going to go off and see if we can get another one. So Andy, are you kind of happy with the way the, that stalk panned out? I'm delighted. 
and now you can see how difficult it is in these willows. It's keeping track of them going through. Do you follow on fast and keep up with them in the rows or do you keep your head and just think, well, it is going in that direction. So we'll just slowly, at the same pace, keep going until we come across it again and again know, and again until the shot comes on. So it's lucky we took our time. Oh yeah, in, in here, if you're going 100 yards in 15 minutes, you're going too fast. As we leave the farm, having successfully taken that young doe, there are animals exactly where we'd hoped to find them earlier. We check the time and come back the following day. To get the best possible view of the field with the willow behind it, we keep low and settle down behind a hawthorn bush. It provides great cover and we're keen to make a bigger impression on the does here. So we, we saw our doe earlier on about 3.30, but she skipped back over into the willow. We're pretty confident she's gonna come back, so fingers crossed our doe goal will be two doe. Huge numbers. Sometimes you just get that feeling in your water that they're not coming to you. So you have to do the chasing. I spot a doe around 120 yards inside the plantation. I have to keep my movement to a minimum, whilst chasing her from aisle to aisle. It's a real game of cat and mouse. Eventually a shot presents itself, but there's a misfire. I reload and this time the 100 grain Lapua bullet does its job. She's hit, and she's hit pretty hard in the chest. The first round I shot, there was actually a misfire on this cartridge. So she was with three other does. They've all skipped through into the bushes. There's one smaller buck. He went a little while ago, he walked on. So we're just gonna give her a few minutes to calm down. I'm gonna go and pick her up. I heard it was a nice, good, clean contact in the chest area, nice deep third, so fingers crossed she won't be too far. I wait for a few minutes to see if there are any others still milling around. Then I spot a younger deer, clearly looking for the doe. This follower has a pronounced limp, and even in the low light, I'm pretty confident it's a buck. He may be out of season, but the issue of animal welfare must play a role. Without sticks or a rest, I need a stable shooting position. Sitting is perfect for this, and I successfully take him too. Okay. Right. Okay, perfect. Now, this is obviously a young buck follower. I shot the older doe, um, which is, we're still looking for her at the moment, and this follower came back to look for us, clearly one of her, one of her fawns. And I noticed he was limping slightly, and so on the back of his leg here, he's got an open sore, an open wound, in his leg looks like he's tried to leap over some barbed wire so not only was he uh, looking for his mother but also injured so i thought we'd take him out just to be on the safe side there's no need for him to be in there in that condition here she is here's our uh, here's our doe now she's an older doe and, uh, and obviously she had that young buck follower with her but now she's, she's in great condition, good, healthy in the body. And as we can see, perfect hard shot. 243 is, is more than enough gun for a, for a roe deer, provided you've got a clear shot to it. So yes, very pleased, very happy with the shot. So our roe call is back up to two, plus a young wounded follower. So I think we've done a great service here this evening and I've earned myself a pint. It's been a real experience hunting in this sort of dense cover and I'll definitely be back for more. For more information on hunting with Andy Richardson, visit www.wildshotsofscotland.co.uk. Team Wild will be back next Wednesday. Visit www.teamwild.tv. Thank you, Team Wild TV. Now, from Roe Deer to Oh Deer, it's David on the Field Sports Channel News Stump.
This is Field Sports Britain News. With the end of the UK's coastal wildfowling season less than a week away, the hard weather last week caused some wildfowling clubs to introduce voluntary bans on shooting. Clubs agreed to introduce voluntary restraint after seven consecutive morning frosts. The government's Environmental Audit Committee has launched a new inquiry into wildlife crime. It aims to follow up its report from 2004, which looked at crimes concerning badgers, birds and even pond life. The committee, however, will not examine hunting with dogs. The consultation closes on the 24th of February. To make a submission, visit www.parliament.uk forward slash eacom. Some sad news and there are two deaths to report in the rural community. Shooting Times' country gun John Humphreys died after a battle with cancer. A lifelong countryman and Countryside Alliance member, John was a staunch supporter of the Alliance's shooting campaign. And legendary racehorse trainer Josh Gifford also died. Another Alliance member and crowned champion jockey four times. He'll be most remembered for Aldeniti's victory at Aintree 31 years ago, after his jockey, Bob Champion, had recovered from cancer. Now, here's this week's big viral video on YouTube. So this gentleman from the USA is mad at his teenage daughter, who has posted on Facebook how much she hates her parents. His film has been viewed more than 20 million times in the last week and has earned 200,000 likes and 20,000 dislikes. And this is how he takes revenge on her laptop. Search YouTube for Facebook Parenting for the Troubled Teen. And finally, Field Sports Channel broke the half million mark last month with 520,487 views. And because we have 250,000 unique users, our audience is now 10 times the number of people who buy Shooting Times magazine. Shooting Times? You are now up to date with Field Sports Britain News. Stalking the stories, fishing for facts. Nice one, David. Now, some say after being raised by wolves, he spent six months as a pigeon decoy. It's the Crow Man. If Crow Man were a Spice Girl, today he's Scary Crow. He's often Sporty Crow and his son is Baby Crow. So it only leaves Posh and Ginger. We'll set those aside for this week as he has his mind on keeping the pigeons off this young rape crop. Um, Justin, who I shoot with quite a lot, he's asked me to come up here and give him a hand to keep a few pigeons off his rape. Uh, as you can see by the fields, it's not ideal conditions. They don't decoy very well in snow. Uh, the snow is just starting to clear. It's a hundred acre field. It's not a really good thing. But we've got a shore here that goes right the way along. A um, load of ivy. Pigeons like ivy. And they tend to make for this corner quite a lot. Uh, so what we're going to do is uh, we're going to have one hide on the corner here one along about 50 metres that way, so we're covering a bigger area. Um, and we're going to give it a go. Another problem with today, bright sunshine, no wind. And it's a long valley, and when you have one shot, it just echoes right the way through. It might be just one, a case of one shot and they're up and away. Um, but they haven't been shot at yet, so hopefully there's a chance we might get a few later on. We've given it a bit of time for the frost to come off, let them have a little bit of a feed, so they know where they've got to come back to. Andy is not a fair weather pigeon shooter. These birds need attention all year round and this crop is particularly vulnerable at the moment. From the middle of February onwards, right the way through March and into April, the pigeons want to be kept off the rape. Through the winter months, they eat the, the big leaves. That's not, where the, that's not the bit that produces the, the flowers, it's the hearts. And as you can see here, the pigeons are just starting on the hearts, they're digging the hearts out. The flowering head's in there. Once they take that flowering head out, they take that flower and head out, it just puts a, um, or cuts the yield. So now is the time from now on, you've really got to hammer these pigeons to keep them off. It's a very bright day and the snow means that Andy has to change his setup to meet the conditions. You say you're using summer patterns for the hide, Andy. Yeah. Seems a bit strange given it's snowing. Well, there's the snow. If I have a, just a normal camouflage net, it's dark, it's dark green. Justin's using one along there but he's right back in the hide, or back in the hedge more, uh, so he's done show up. But my, I'm out in, the, out in the snow a bit, just, just, breaks, up, just, just breaks up the colour, but it's just not a black blob. Yeah. Um, that's the only problem with the snow. Um, but yeah, it's just to break it up. Um, yeah, that's, that's the reason for doing it. Not everything is lost in the snow. This fox is very clear, then disappears when normal service resumes. 
With everything set out, we can retire to the hide and wait for the fun to start. The response is good what, and the hide positioned in, in front of the IVN next to this rape is proving effective. For the first part of the morning, Andy is replacing his Beretta with a Remington, which is straight out of the box. You got a new gun today? Yeah, I've got a new, it's a new Remington Versa Max. Um, yeah, trying it out. Feels nice. Um, the adjustment on it's brilliant. Um, yeah, you can. It's got so much adjustment on it. Um, I've, I have adjusted it, but I haven't quite got it right. It's, it's got a bit too much cast off on it. So. Um, it's your, your first time you've tried yeah, it in the field today. Yeah, it is. Yeah, I'll get the angle by the end of the day. I hope. Once Andy is in the groove, there's not a lot you can do to snap him out of it. Hypnotised by pigeons, it can take a few well, attempts to get what you want from him. It. The uh, action seems to slow down a little bit, Andy. Yeah, there's a, another right field. <coughs> we saw the pigeons all flying along the top of the ridge there earlier. There's another right field about a mile and a half along through the valley. Doesn't belong to Justin's boss. Um, all we can think is that's where they've gone. It's about, it's probably about the same acreage as this, about a hundred acre lump. Um, but it's the same old story, isn't it? Unless there's someone there, that's where they're going to go. And uh, that's when it wants a few of you out. Justin doesn't know the chaps that shoot it, so. Um, just. Justin doesn't know the people that shoot it. Justin doesn't know the people that shoot it. <laughs> but, um, Does Justin know the people that shoot it? Uh, no, he doesn't. He's only been out a couple of hours, but his bag is pretty impressive. OK, so we've had, we've had a couple of hours of it, Andy. Had yeah. A few pigeons. How, how do you think we've got on? Uh, yeah, we've had a good day. It's 50-odd pigeons we've shot. Um, done what we come here to do and that's to keep the pigeons off the rope. So, yeah, so I think good time's been had by all. He may not be ginger or posh, but Andy, the crow man crow, definitely has pigeon power. From pests back to deer. He's stalked deer and antelope and dangerous game all over the world. What American hunter Wayne Van Zwoll has never had luck with yet is a muntjack. Oliver Power of the English Safari Company has a rather special guest with a rather special mission. Out stalking with him today on the border of Oxfordshire and Gloucestershire is top American hunting writer Wayne Van Zwoll. Wayne has been most everywhere and stalked and shot most everything, but he has never connected with a muntjack. Are you what you might call the United States yeehaw? hunting writer or is that not you that's not me <laughs> i i very much enjoy hunting but uh i've uh, i also enjoy wildlife and uh did a phd in wildlife policy so it's it's not just a uh, an avocation for me i uh i like the uh, the out of doors like to be a field and certainly like to share it with others that's why i write uh, and you've written a load of books tell me about those I've done 14 books, uh, about 2,500 magazine articles, low these many years, and uh, books are mainly about uh, big game hunting, deer and elk hunting, uh, ballistics and optics, uh, technical firearms topics, and the history of firearms as well. Have you come across uh, any of these three species before, roe, fallow, muntjac? Yes, I've, I've seen fallow deer and shot fallow deer and roe deer as well, but I have not shot a muntjac, and I have yet to see a muntjac here. I've been told they're here. This is south of England stalking, so Oliver says there is more to the morning than muntjac. Oh, we'll bump into roe and fallow and uh, the usual mix of uh, English wildlife, which uh, will be a treat for Wayne to see. What's it like having Wayne here? Is it, I mean, you know, he's, he's an American, he comes with, from a different culture, but he, he is a very well-known hunter. Is, is, is the pressure on a bit? Uh, yes and no. But uh, Wayne's a very delightful chap to have around and it's nice to um, swap stories. The deer have been feasting on the corn laid out for the birds by the gamekeeper. Pheasant feeders are a boon for any stalker. However, pheasants bursting out of cover next to you are a bane. 
We see tree damage and slots, all the signs of deer you could hope for, but we see no deer. Perhaps the rest of the wildlife is a clue. On this cold winter morning, and despite the noise of planes taking off from nearby RAF Fairford, nothing comes close unless you are absolutely still. Oliver wants this stalk to be exciting, so we are not freezing ourselves to a high seat. However, it could be we are making too much of a disturbance. It is not a successful morning. The snow is generally welcomed by big game hunters because it, it affords them the ability to see tracks and, and, and track the, the animals. But uh, snow can also have a depressing effect on animal movements. If animals sense a storm coming in, typically there's what we call a feeding frenzy before the storm because the animals know that during a storm and possibly after a storm, because they don't know how much snow it's going to drop, uh, that feeding will be inhibited. So they tend to, to tank up before a, before a storm hits. And that may depress activity the morning after because they're already full. In case we do come across a shootable beast, Wayne has a pre-stalking checklist. How do you choose ammunition for your deer species? Yeah, well, it, you know, well for our deer are quite a bit bigger than, than muntjac, of course. They're uh, more along our white-tailed and mule deer, along the lines of fallow deer in size, and our elk are bigger, of course. For white-tailed deer and mule deer, we like a bullet that opens a little bit faster. Um, I shouldn't say faster because all bullets start opening on impact. That's, that's when the, uh, the deceleration is greatest. But uh, I'll say more violently so that we expend the energy quicker within the animal because they are light-framed animals. And we get quicker kills with something like the ballistic tip, for example, in deer. Uh, for elk, we would use the uh, Norma Oryx. Um, how do you set up your scope when you're just about to set out on a, on a muntjac trip like this, for example? Sure. Well, I, I generally prefer a scope of lower magnification than many hunters. Uh, it is an aiming device. It's not a telescope for stargazing. So uh, <coughs> we want something with a reasonably broad field of view, one that you can hold steady offhand if you must shoot offhand, which is, of course, a position of last resort because it's the least steady. Uh, but I, I prefer scopes of four and six power fixed. However, variables are very common nowadays. When, I, <clears throat> when I'm hunting with a variable, like this Zeiss, uh, this is a two, uh, two and a half to ten. I always keep it at three or four when I'm walking because uh, <clears throat> when, you, when you're moving, you're, you're apt, most apt to surprise something at, at close range. And uh, for an urgent shot, you always want a wide field of view. And uh, so three or four power should work fine. Uh, if you must turn it up, if you really like to shoot at high magnification at distance, you typically have plenty of time to turn the scope up. You never have time to turn it down. For the final tip, and for reasons which will become clear, we move to a local gun shop. I thought a sling was just to keep the rifle on your shoulder till you're ready to shoot, unless you're in the army. <laughs> well, that's a good point, and many slings are indeed carrying straps only. And uh, for that purpose, a sling and a carrying strap can be used the same way. But a sling, proper sling, like the Brownells Latigo, has a shooting loop that's adjustable independent of overall sling length. And that's very important. Uh, without that, it's much less useful for steadying the rifle. Okay. I can demonstrate. Yeah, show us how it works, please. For convenience here in the shop, I'll demonstrate in kneeling. Uh, you can use this as well in sitting and prone. Any position in which your left elbow is locked. And uh, <clears throat> to, to use a Brownells Latigo sling, give it a half a turn out like this. Slip your arm through the adjustable shooting loop. Run the keeper down tight above your triceps. Flip your hand over like this. And the half turn out that I gave it at, at the start ensures that the sling will lie flat against the back of my hand. Otherwise, it will twist. Okay, in this case then, the sling is adjusted properly. This rifle's a bit short for me, but <clears throat> you can see the, uh, see the principle at work here. The sling is very tight from the forward swivel to my upper arm. And what that does is transfer the rifle's weight from my forearm to my shoulder muscles, which are much bigger and more able to carry the rifle's weight without strain straining. The sling also acts to pull the rifle into my shoulder. And one thing you'll notice here, because this is a shooting sling, this part of the sling, from my arm to the buttstock, is loose. That has to be the case. Were this a single strap, 
it would be tight all the way around, around my arm and to the buttstock, and it would tend to pull the buttstock away from my shoulder and twist it. And that's not what you want. So, <clears throat> with this shooting sling in, in place, I can relax into the rifle, and if I'm not talking, the rifle stays quite still, even though I'm not even steadying it with this hand. The other reason to visit the Cotswolds is because Oliver is sure that our problems finding Muntjac are due to the lack of a good call. This part of Oxfordshire and Gloucestershire has plenty of good gun shops, but Cotswold shooting in Sirencester has no Buzzolo calls, and neither does Addenbourne Field Sports in Whitney. Oliver finds one at Francis Lovell in Whitney. We stalk, we squeak, and we stalk and we squeak. We are rewarded with the occasional flash of a departing muntjac, but these normally busy little deer are not on the move. Then Wayne and Oliver make a strange discovery. They find a muntjac shivering in a stream. It is clear that a dog has driven the deer here. Oliver talks to the dog walker. People don't understand the juxtaposition of hunters. They always ask you, don't you like wildlife? Why do you kill wildlife? We like to see it as much as the next person, but it's very upsetting when we see, see ill-informed people letting off their dogs which aren't trained, that go in and just kill animals, and as we're always left to pick up the pieces. I stayed with it for about an hour, roughly, but not close at hand. I went across the, uh, back across the river and, and just spied him to see how he was getting on. But after about 35 minutes, he started to move a little bit and then just just ran off into the thicket. Wayne has to go home empty-handed, but that's one dog walker who may think again before they let their pet run riot after deer. Well, we're back next week. And if you're watching this on YouTube, please don't hesitate to hit the subscribe button, which is now permanently just about there above my head. Or go to our website, fieldsportschannel.tv, where you can scroll down to the bottom and put your email address into our constant contact box so we can clog up and spam and infiltrate your email inbox or click to like us on Twitter, follow us on Facebook or whichever way around of those two you prefer and you will get news of our programme every week. This has been Field Sports Britain.